welcome to another episode of Raw Conversations, where we'll be sharing insights and having meaningful conversations with some amazing people in the space of nutrition and wellness. Um, I'm your host, Sharon Cryan, the founder and CEO of Food Nerd. And today's guest is Trisha Shea. She's a registered dietitian. Uh, she has a master's in dietetics and a bachelor's in exercise science. Uh, she's currently working as a nutritionist for a supplemental nutrition assistance program delivering nutrition education to SNAP recipients. Um, so Trisha, thank you so much for joining us. Thank, thank you so you. much for having me. Hello, everyone. Awesome. And so if you want to just kind of introduce yourself, just a little highlight like sure. your and why you are in nutrition, that would be super helpful for everyone. Yeah. So I'll try and make it a little bit shorter than necessarily what it is. Um, so I actually started out in exercise science and initially it was because I was interested in physical therapy. And that kind of, once I started actually shadowing people in the field, like I just realized it wasn't really my passion. I know like people throw the word passion around all the time, but it really just didn't excite me. I was kind of bored with it. So I was like, oh, what do I do now? So I ended up joining the Army National Guard because I thought I might have an interest in more, of, um, you know, clinical healthcare, like uh, nursing or something like that. So I did that. And then I realized, no, that's not for me either. And then um, eventually just based on my interest, uh, you know, reading books about nutrition and listening to tons of podcasts and even audiobooks, um, I kind of, it kind of fell into my lap and I was like, hey, this is super cool. Like, you know, this is kind of the forefront of where medicine is going, which I thought was amazing. So I kind of, I wanted to get involved. So I think that's where I ended up. <laughs> well, yay. Well, now you're here, which is awesome. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what you do now um, and what you do in relation to SNAP and nutrition education, uh, because I think that that is such an important topic and discussion. And I think that there needs to be so much more education brought to this, you know, particularly to, you know, um, people who are participating in this program. Um, and so it's through programs like yours that this is actually happening. So can you explain um, exactly kind of what you do? Sure. So it is, so it's, we call it SNAP Ed, so the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. So it is a grant funded program by the government. Um, it is actually formerly, um, it was known as food stamps. So basically what I, my job, my role is as a nutritionist, is to go out into low income areas, um, so preferentially ones that have um, SNAP recipients within them, and we deliver nutrition education uh, to those individuals. So we actually work with all age groups. It includes, um, so like youth, so we go into like schools, uh, ranging from, you know, like um, elementary to we have a age range, it has to be six years old and above. That's just what's built into our grant. And then we also, um, work with adults. So I've gone into libraries before, certain um, adult programs. And then we also work with older adults and senior programs. And we use evidence-based curriculum, um, which we follow to deliver our lessons. And then we also use um, food demos to try and teach people how to make healthy, uh, budget-friendly meals. And then we also follow the USDA guidelines. Um, so uh, using my plate as a reference. So basically it's, um, you know, the main points are making half your plate fruits and vegetables, a quarter of your plate grains, preferably um, half of your grains each day should be whole grains, a quarter of your plate um, protein, which could include anim lean animal or plant-based proteins, and then also um, dairy is included as well, low-fat or uh, fat-free dairy. Awesome. So I, so I kind of want to break it into like two topics. Like I want to talk about what it's like, like actually for you on a daily basis, carrying out this education, but um, we'll get into that. And, but at first I kind of want to talk about in particular you, because you are a plant-based eater yourself. Um, and obviously that's kind of stemmed, I imagine, from your own, you know, diving into certain different research mm -hmm. and such. So being a plant-based nutritionist in a government-based program, how has that kind of how does that feel? How have you, you know, kind of, how did that in, impact you in the way that you like to kind of spread nutrition? Yeah, so that, that is a wonderful question. And I actually been <laughs> thinking about this lately. So I initially got into nutrition because I was really interested in food as medicine. So like how I never thought that, you know, especially like way back when, when like I was going to school, like God only knows, like, sorry, mom, but like, you know, what you ate growing up and just like all this process, like sugar laden, fat laden, junk 
junk food and like, I mean, that's what a lot of people still are brought up to be eating and it's kind of hard to, you know, to um, have behavior change as an adult. Um, so yeah, growing up like that and then eventually um, coming into the whole, um, like more, I guess more of a holistic approach to health in terms of using more of natural products, like using food and like exercise and, and maybe different like herbs and things like that. So when it comes to following the USDA guidelines, I, I, I do, it, it is difficult because I really do have strong viewpoints in terms of like my belief system with food. And like, I understand that it's not necessarily accessible to everyone. And, and you want to try and, especially for low income individuals, you want to try and, you know, make it affordable and, and accessible as possible. But I would say that a lot of times I'm like, oh, like, you know, I would say I try to follow mostly like, you know, dairy free, like I try and like stay away from like, you know, refined grains, especially even like whole grains and kind of like, you know, with whole wheat bread and that type of stuff, it can be like inflammatory. And, you know, of course there's like so many studies with dairy and, um, you know, uh, industrial farming. That's another thing where I'm like, ah, cause it's, you know, it's just, it's more of a moral thing, but at the same time, they're being pumped with like the antibiotics and the growth hormones are being, being treated so horribly that, and especially even the workers aren't treated very well in those environments. So yeah, I would say it's definitely, it's like a tug of war between like the job itself and, and then my personal beliefs. And I, and I try and, you know, obviously to set that aside during my work. Right. Do you find that like, you know, um, I guess where your, where your kind of deviations from say the standard USDA guidelines, um, do you find that more, you know, dietitians, more people in your space are also kind of deviating and looking at alternative you know, resources as well? Or do you feel like you're still alone in it or kind of where does that, where does that make you feel? Yeah, I would say, I would say definitely in my space, I think most nutritionists follow along with the guidelines and maybe, maybe, you know, there's a few that are interested in holistic, um, more of a holistic way of eating um, in terms of like, you know, less processed foods and less animal products. But I feel for the majority of individuals, I think they just kind of take it as is like, okay, like, yeah, you need milk, you need it to get your calcium. Like, that's really, really important. And, um, you know, like, especially meat, like, oh, where are you going to get your protein from? If you, you know, if you're not having meat and then like that whole conversation. And I think that it's just, you know, it's, I feel like this style of eating, um, you know, like the meat and potatoes, like that type of, um, like eating behaviors has been around for so long that I think it's just kind of hard for people to evolve to some degree, but that's not to say that there isn't tons of dietitians out there that are following more of a plant-based, more of a holistic, um, way of eating. In, in your kind of scene, you still kind of feel a little bit of a loner in that sense, because it is, it isn't, even though it's becoming so much more, acknowledge and the research is becoming so much more discussed and, and really dove into it's not you know it's it's not really mass yet you know that that understands mm -hmm. really isn't mass spread yet and so we're still we're still getting there and um so now i kind of want to talk about you know when you go out to the, the low income communities and i myself grew up in a, a very low income community as well my parents um, my mom was a single mother of six and she raised us on food stamps. So I remember having our food stamps. I remember going to the store, being remember what I could and couldn't buy with it, things like that. So definitely this really hits home to me because my whole, you know, growing up understanding of like food was really like whatever tastes best. Like that's really what, like, you know, we didn't receive any information besides the food stamps. Like it never came with a, pamph a pamphlet that said, this is how you cook vegetables. This is how much fruit you should have. And like we didn't, that wasn't something that was given. And so, um, and I think that if it were, you know, at least we would have had the opportunity to see it and understand it. Um, but that was, you know, almost 30 years ago. So now where like, where has, you know, where has the, the programs changed? What resources are out there for people in the low income communities that have food stamps and that's really their bulk of resources for food um, and, so yeah, I don't want to overload you a question, but go ahead. Oh, no, you're fine. <laughs> and then we'll talk about like how people are receptive to it. Yeah. So basically okay. like what's different now between when I was growing up with food. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So I think, so we've, 
always follow the USDA guidelines. So, oh my gosh, I can't even remember now how long it's been, but you know how my play evolved from the, the pyramid. And so pyramid. It's, it's so funny even thinking about it. I was like, where was fruits and vegetables even on the pyramid? Like it was, I feel like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't at the bottom where grains were. So it's kind of like, I mean, I guess I'm kind of sidetracking, but it, it's kind of how big food industry impacts what the USDA is giving in terms of guidelines of what people should be eating. Cause that's, that's always like a factor in terms of like politics and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I believe I wasn't working way back then, but I, I, I'm assuming that, you know, the dietitians, the nutritionists um, for SNAP Ed were following those guidelines and giving, you know, working their lessons um, based on uh, curriculums curriculums that were based off of those um, eating patterns that were recommended. So yeah, we follow the um, dietary guidelines for Americans. So now like I feel as though, um, you know, it's definitely gotten a lot better. You know, there's a lot more research coming out. Like I feel as though, um, you know, fat in general, general isn't vilified as much and sugar is definitely taking way more center stage in terms of like, okay, finally they added it to the nutrition facts label. Like, okay, come on people. Like, finally and like how it differentiates between total sugars and added sugars and, and I think that is huge because people are still afraid of eating fruit and just you know healthy whole foods that is just like oh wait there's too much sugar in it and it's like oh well what about you know a cliff bar or something like that you don't realize that there's like 20 grams of sugar in there you know whereas like the same amount of apple but it's all natural but I'm sorry I'm digressing but anyways so yeah I would say that in terms of what has changed I think that so we have um, approved curriculums that we follow and they're evidence-based. So they've been, uh, you know, tried, proved and tested um, to have effective uh, positive behavior change. So I think that, you know, I believe that it's just that those curriculums need to keep up with the changing dietary guidelines. However, it's kind of like every five years, it's a long time to wait to kind of, you know, there's so much nutrition research coming out all the time. So I feel like five years is a really long time to wait. And I feel like the, the curriculum should be evolving, you know, year by year, even less than that. Right. I didn't realize that the, the mark was five years. Um, I, for some reason, I thought it was like four in my head, but even mm -hmm. a year, there's a huge difference. Like even jumping, mm -hmm. um, because literally, I mean, things come out like weekly, right? And so that's kind of yes. bizarre that, you know, the, the guidelines are pretty much untouched for five years. And then they're like, okay, let's take it all into account. Um, yeah. So how, you know, how has, you know, the, the people that you're actually going and you're, and you're trying to really um, share this education with, how, how is the, you know, receptivity of it? Is it, is it mm -hmm. something that is, because food is emotional, food is personal. Um, mm -hmm. How do you feel it's received like across the board in general. And then maybe you can kind of dive into um, some of the main factors that will make it less receptive versus more. Okay, yeah, sure. So I would say, so let's start with our all our age groups that we work with. Um, I would say for the youth, um, for the most part, like the younger kids, oh, it's amazing. Like they're so into it. They're like, you know, they love having fun with the games and like they're all into the fruits and vegetables and all that stuff. But I mean, you kind of have to take it what it's worth and that they can't make, you know, they're not going out and buying food. They're not making their own choices. So it's kind of tough because I think it is really important to introduce education to them, you know, in terms of eating healthy at a really young age. But like, it's like, how much do you remember what you were taught way back then? But I think the exposure is really good, but I don't think it's going to have maybe um, like a tangible change in terms of maybe their future eating behaviors. Um, but then when you get to adults, I would say, I would say it's definitely a mixed bag. I would say that I, to be honest, like definitely I've seen people like kind of fall asleep <laughs> during like what I was talking about, which is like so funny, but just kind of like sad. Cause it's like, you know, I have to stick to the curriculum so I can't get, you know, necessarily super interesting information about everything. Um, and we also can't give people like individualized advice or anything like that. Um, so I would say that sometimes, you know, you can see people, they're really interested in like holding on to every word that you say, but then other times they're just kind of there for, you know, because we do give out free food samples. So, you know, a lot of times people just join for the food samples and we do give out incentives. So that definitely is helpful for participation. Um, and then I would say with the older adults, it's definitely much harder to engage older adults because think about it, they're like 
you know, for like in their 80s or 70s, it's like they're set in their ways. Like you are not telling them, you know, any which way to do something differently. They're just kind of like, okay, like, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to, you know, basically to like do something to get out of my regular routine and maybe get a food sample and like kind of leave it at that, I guess. Now, I guess for, for you when, you know, you're so passionate about this and you understand and you've seen the data and the research of just how powerful food is and like how, even if it's, you know, you don't, you don't always have to go so intense, you know, you eat like mm -hmm. the, because, you know, our bodies are these fine tuned machines, you know, just even if you increase the quality of your fuel that you're putting inside the machine, just a little bit, it will make a difference. And so do you find mm -hmm. that you, you know, that people are willing to make a little shift or is it people are just, you still see, you know, people kind of saying like, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to change my view of understanding of food because mm -hmm. it's such a comfort thing. Do you see, do you feel comfort coming in more over logic of like, oh wow, what you're saying sounds right, but mm, I love my this, this, and this. So no. Right. Yeah. I, that's, that's a tough one to say. We do, we do take evaluations, but it usually is just like, um, you know, we'll, we'll do like a series. So we'll do like, maybe like five to 10 different lessons. Then at the end of the series, we'll have them fill out like questionnaire, like, oh, are you eating more fruits and vegetables? Are you eating more whole grains? So I think it, it's definitely hard to say if they're actually making real life tangible changes. However, I would like to think that they are, but I have to be realistic. And, I, and I'm kind of thinking that like, exactly what you said like people are comfortable you know it's familiar it tastes good and yeah you know they I, I think that it's important to educate people and have them understand why it's important to eat healthy but I kind of think that people kind of you live in this little bubble where it's like okay like I feel fine now or even if I don't feel very good it's just it's my normal so I'm not going to question it and then eventually I think what I, I, I'm speaking in generalizations because I'm obviously I'm not exactly sure but I think that for most people once they have like a chronic illness or some, you know, really huge like health condition that comes up, that's when, that's when they'll pull the brakes back and like, whoa, like, okay, I, I either I, I have to figure something out or, you know, whatever, like, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to do what I'm going to do. And, you know, when I was interning in the hospitals, like, I was just amazed at, the, at people, like, it was actually really sad. Like, people had so many comorbidities and so many different chronic illnesses, and they were young. And I'm just like, wow. And, like, the hospital is not a place that you can really get education across. Like, they're kind of in, they're out. You can't follow up with them. So, I mean, I, I think that, you know, I would like to think we're making small changes, um, but I guess we'll, we'll have to get more info to determine yeah. that. <laughs> And that's, you know, I guess like my experience with working with, with people on just like listening to what it is that makes it difficult for them to eat healthier. Um, I would say, you know, nine times out of 10, you know, it's not so much of the access to the food as it is the, the emotional component. I think that to me, you know, especially with my, my journey growing, you know, growing up, like you know, food equated emotional and comfort to me, right? Um, and so like, I never, when I was little, I never thought of food as literally like fuel for my body. Like I didn't separate my body and its health from my identity. So I was just like, this is just like, I can eat whatever, especially when you're young, right? Because you don't feel those effects necessarily. Um, but then you get to a point where you're so used to just feeling that same way. You don't know any better. You don't know what it feels like to feel a better version of yourself, a healthier version, because you've only known the unhealthy you. And so I think that was for me, one of the hardest things was like, well, I feel fine. Like, this is all I know. And you have nothing to like compare it to. So when I actually was like, okay, I'm just going to like switch and just eat super clean within a couple of days, I was like, hmm, wow. Okay. I, I slept better. You know, like, uh, my bowel movements are completely different. Like I started noticing the real physical changes and I feel like it's so hard. Like if more people felt the physical changes and they allowed their bodies to actually consistently eat healthy, then it would be so much easier to convince them to make it a lifestyle. But to me, it was like getting them to the point where they were going to make that shift is the hardest because it's like, you know, I hear all the time, well, you know, my great grandma, you know, she ate whatever she wanted and she lived till 90. And she smokes cigarettes and all these things, but it's like, you know, they have no idea the food that we're eating now is very different than the food our great grandparents or even our grandparents ate. I mean, the food now, especially, you know, from being a food manufacturer and, and 
looking into the regulation, I mean, there's like over 6,000 chemicals now that are allowed in our food supply. And those are man-made chemicals, mm-hmm. which is terrifying. So none of that was in our grandparents' food supply. None of the way that we process our food mm-hmm. was the way their food was processed. And I'm, you know me, I'm super passionate about the way we cook our food, the way we process our food. It's not necessarily like the, in the actual ingredient half the time, like an oat is great, but what are you doing to that oat to get it into that form factor, to make it shelf stable for 25 years? Like what is happening? And you know, the scary thing is like, okay, most people just see oat on a label and they're like, oh my God, you know, Trish told me oats are great so I can eat oats, but that oat bar or whatever it is, that cookie that was made out of that, it's not the same thing. It's really not. And so that's like the hard thing to communicate is like food can get so intense and there's so much to explain that often I feel, and I can't imagine you doing this as your job every day. So like, you know, it's like the macro view where you're like, there's so much. And then you can dive so deep and you're just like, like, I imagine, you know, it's, it's probably frustrating for you because you're just like, you want to tell them, especially you, because you've gone out of your way to research even more. So it's like, how do we how do we effectively communicate this? Because it's not this insignificant thing. It is everything. Like food and health. Like I mean, that's if you don't have your health, what do you have, right? And so, mm-hmm. um, so it's you know, it's programs like yours that are actually like on the ground doing the thing that needs to be done to make our our entire country healthier. Um, and like I said, like I grew up on food stamps and I have zero recollection of ever having someone like you presenting at our community center or presenting at our library or like, I, I don't know if that was a thing 30 years ago. Um, Mm -hmm. but just the fact that that does exist, like shows like how much hope there is for, for people to actually have resources to get healthier. Um, and so I would say like, what is, what, in your opinion, like, what do you think that the communities like really need most to actually become their, their healthiest selves? Like, what do you think the true pieces that are missing? Yeah, I would say that there, there are a lot of components that are out of one's control. Cause I think there's like a lot of health disparities in terms of when it comes to um, low income and then also um, race, race and different races and minorities. I think that it just like, it's, it's a very complex web of factors. And I think that a lot of times it's, you know, you're, we're uh, for social economic status, how like the three main components are income, education, occupation. Well, guess what? If, you know, people are in low income, areas and you know maybe they don't graduate from high school or maybe they they go to a low-income school which you know where maybe education is subpar um you know they're probably not gonna go out and you know go to college or something like that so therefore you know their job opportunities are going to be limited they might be working more of like a minimum wage job and then they're Therefore, their ability to actually generate a livable income is going to be um, significantly decreased so i think that plays a large role into it because for the for the supplemental nutrition assistance program, it's not meant to be your your monthly grocery bill. It's meant to supplement, you know, the income that you already have coming in. But for these larger families, they, you know, if you have a lot of kids, maybe your number one priority is to get food on the table in in whatever shape or form that comes out to be. It does it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to try and get a you know to serve them healthier food, like a better overall diet quality. You just want to give them calories. So I would say. Oh, this is such a tough one because there's, there's just so much at play here. Um, but I think education is huge. And, I, and obviously, I think our, our programs are making a difference by offering free education to um, individuals that might not have the access to it. Um, I think that additionally, um, you know, keeping our government funded programs going because before COVID happened, they were, um, the government was trying to cut SNAP benefits and make it, you know, harder for people to obtain them. And could you imagine what, where we would be now? Because, you know, even before COVID, there were so many people that were food insecure. And now it's, I can't even imagine what the numbers are, you know, considering what we're, the pandemic we're going through now. And then not to mention that, I think that people also need, um, I would say like, mental support like mental and emotional support because like you're saying the whole the emotional component of food like people are stressed out if you're low income you know you work two jobs to help pay the bills and that affects your mental health so that's going to stress you out and you're going to be more 
prone to, um, you know, to have unhealthy coping mechanisms when it comes to dealing with your stress. So that could look like substance abuse, that could be, look like overeating, you know, unhealthy junk food, or it could look like I don't have time to make my own food. So guess what? I'm going to the nearest fast food place because I, I can't make a home cooked meal for my family. I don't have time. Or maybe they do, maybe you do live in a food desert and maybe you don't have access. Maybe you don't have transportation to a grocery store or there's something else called food swamps that I learned about. So it's basically that there's really no grocery stores in, in an area around you. It's more so like fast food and convenience stores. So your overall diet quality is going to be extremely limited in those circumstances. Wow. Yeah. Education. <laughs> Education is huge. And, you know, I, I really, I think what you just said that, you know, having the mental and the emotional support and being able to pull the, the, the paint for somebody like the whole picture. Cause if you just say food or you just say this, you're not addressing the whole person because you know, no matter who you are, you're a person, right? No matter your income, no matter what. And, and if you don't create an understanding of, you know, this is somebody that has goals and ambitions, and they also have these basic human needs that have to be met. And unfortunately, if those human basic needs aren't met, then all the goals and the ambitions and all the things that they want to do in life, they fall secondary to the human needs. And um, that's something that I'm very passionate about. And I, you know, I really just started kind of educating myself on it within this last couple of years. And it's one of the things that I, you know, which is why we started making the foods that we did, because, you know, seeing the difference of a child when they're being, when they're young and they're developing, if they're getting their nutrients, the difference that a child may, that is not getting their nutrients, I mean, you're setting them up for a completely different quality of life. And I think that that's something that's not, really discussed because yes, you know, you can have access to free education, free schooling for people who don't have their families can't pay for college. Like there's all these incredible resources, but you can never undo unhealthy, you know, from a biological standpoint, like if you can never undo that, right? Like you can't go back and make, give their body the tools that it needed to develop properly. So I like to kind of think like, what are, you know, in a lot of this, you can't measure or it, there's no, no one's looked into it to the degree of like, what are the disadvantages from a biological standpoint that people growing up in low income areas are subjected to? I think that that's something that we would find to be very sad and disheartening if we ever really understood the data on it of like, you know, when a kid is eating Doritos for breakfast versus a kid that's eating, you know, a, a sprouted oatmeal with banana, like what is happening biologically because that that brain is needs food right like that brain is developing and it really breaks my heart to, to see that because mm -hmm. think about it if you're not satiated you don't have nutrients to function properly that day when you're sitting in a classroom that kid he may not have the ability to fully pay attention to fully absorb what's going on because we know you know products that low-income families have access to, which is really the Doritos, the processed candy. We know those additives are, you know, they affect the brain, right? Like they exacerbate ADHD and they make, you know, they're really neurotoxins in so many of our foods that it breaks my heart to, to think of the impact that that can have. Um, but it also makes me, you know, feel like there's a lot of hope that if the education could be communicated to the parents, who are the ones who make the decisions about the way it's going to change the trajectory of their child, their entire child's life. Maybe that would like strike home a little bit harder of like, you know, if we had some stats to show them like, Hey, a kid who doesn't get proper nutrition, X, Y, and Z happens. I wish we had that. Do you know what I'm saying? I wish, because then you could take that data and when, you know, less people would fall asleep, I think in a class, right? <laughs> right. It was going to impact them directly these like core just wrenching stats of like this is the disconnect and mm -hmm. uh, you know a lot of people say healthy food is expensive eating healthy is expensive it is if you're going to go to a restaurant and buy a very expensive salad unfortunately it is and i hate when i you know i'm at a restaurant and the healthiest thing is a 20 dollars salad but a burger is nine bucks i'm like what what is this right <laughs> um, but you know when it comes to you know when you're at the store um, I think there is a huge component to educating people. And that's what I would love to maybe collaborate with you on or do something where we show people like, let's show you how cost effective eating fruits and vegetables are. Like, let's show oh, yeah. you how cheap it is. Like, 
for example, like my pantry is loaded with brown rice and quinoa and it's loaded with nuts and beans. Beans are so cheap. And wow. it's, it's like <laughs> lentils. <laughs> exactly. Lentils, oh my God, lentils are everything, right? Like, and the things that you could do with it, like if we could just explain, you know, how to make a lentil burger and it costs mm -hmm. pennies, it costs pennies to make it. Um, I think that is something that, you know, maybe there's a way we can kind of like help or, you yes. know, do something, like a spin off. Um, because it's the confidence, right? Like if someone tells you to buy lentils, but you've never had lentils or you've never made them, the odds of you buying them are so low. No, because on their own, it's like, you need to doctor them up, just like everything else. You know, you got to add your spices and, you know, everything else to make it taste better. Yeah, it, it, it takes a little bit more, you know, it's like everything else. It's difficult up front, but once you do it and once you, you build up a little bit of confidence, you know, then it becomes part of your lifestyle. And making those lentils, mm -hmm. soaking them, cooking them, adding in those spices, it's now your second nature versus the craft mac and cheese that we're just used to, right? Um, yes. So, so yeah, so I don't know, I would love to, you know, brainstorm with you separately of like different ways that, you know, um, to kind of get the, the emotional, the mental, the education, the cooking education, like all of it into a package. <laughs> yeah, I love that like, idea. I'm all for yeah. it. That sounds that's amazing. What think, that's what I think people need, you know, um, mm -hmm. and yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm just, I'm super grateful that people like you exist um, because you're seeing like on a daily basis, the people who need it the most, the, the change that it can make in our health, our entire healthcare system. Um, and so, so yeah, so I just want to say thank you so much for like what you do. Um, and thank you so much for like your time for coming on and chatting with me. I'm sure we'll do another one. And, like, oh, of course. Thank you more. so much, Sharon. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, if, if you have anything else that you want to kind of sign off and say, or say to anybody that's listening about, you know, anything, any advice, Anything you can think of, um, yeah, please, please tell us. Okay, sure, yeah. I would think that the last thought I'd want to leave with people is to try to simplify things. Like, we, everyone has to make healthy eating so complicated. And if it's like, we just simplify it to its, you know, its core components, just try and eat as much plant-based food as possible. And, you know, get in your fruits and vegetables. You can eat, you know, they don't always have to be fresh. You can use frozen ones, which are more cost-effective, and canned ones as long as you watch out for, like, what the additional ingredients and sodium and, you know, added sugar and ingredients in, in terms of that. But I would say that, you know, stick to the core simple principles. Stop trying to overcomplicate it. You do not have to follow a specific diet. You know, I, I feel like diets are so trendy these days. And even like plant-based, I guess, could be somewhat of a trendy diet. But I mean, it's core. It's just, it's literally just eating plants. It's eating what another nature intended us to eat. Um, so I would say, yeah, keep everything simple. Then also like, don't be hard on yourself. I think that most people, hey, you try and, you know, make a substantial change. You're trying to change literally every single thing about your diet. They're trying to do like a diet overhaul. It's like, that doesn't work. Like whoever sticks to those types of plans. So I'd say just try and like be easy on yourself. You know, everyone's learning. Um, I would say make a goal, like maybe like a monthly goal and then try and, you know, have a weekly goal. Even if it's just a weekly goal of like trying to cook a vegetable a different way, or like you said, maybe trying to make a different bean dish, like a chili or something like that. I think if, if you stick to small attainable goals and, and just keep it simple, then I think that most people are probably able to um, eventually make significant changes in their life because they all add up, right? Absolutely. No, I think that's, I think that's the best advice that you can give is like, yeah, keep it simple and you deserve mm -hmm. to keep it simple because setting yourself up for success is, is the best thing we can do. So Trish, thank you so much for being thank on. You. Yeah, oh, your awesome. products are amazing. I love what you're doing. I think it's like so phenomenal how you're just changing the entire manufacturing space of food and that, I mean, that's what we need. So you're on the forefront. So thank you for what you do thank as you well. So <laughs> that's um, super encouraging. Um, and so everybody who's listening, thanks so much for joining us. Another episode of Raw Conversations. Um, please be sure to rate and review and subscribe um, and then visit our website, which is foodnerdinc.com for more information and also for some awesome education on blogs. We actually work with Trish on a lot of our blogs um, because she is such an information junkie and she's always, you know, diving into it and, and really making the, the research digestible to everybody. So please check on foodnerdinc.com to read the blogs um, that she's written. Um, because it's been tremendous working with you. So Trish, thank you so much. Oh, thank thanks so for much. having me. Thanks everyone.